The place is so special to any person that has grown up loving the game of golf or wanting to be great at the game of golf. I'll never forget as a kid, you're, you're on the putting green and, or you know, on the chipping green, you're like, oh, you know, I had to get this up and down to win the Masters. And then to have the opportunity to make a putt to win, it's just, you know, making a dream become a reality. Receiving the green jacket, which is, I believe me, that feeling is sublime. It's sublime because it lasts for the rest of your life. And the reception in that first tee is something you have to see to appreciate. I can't wait for it. I'm in the gym this morning. Hey, work it out. Pow, 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 pow. Just so that I can hit a good shot. So because never has there been so many people watch one shot. On this episode of Beyond the Memes, we meet up with several Masters champions and dive into all things Augusta National, its traditions, untold stories, and what it's like to fulfill a lifelong dream of slipping on the green jacket. When you watch Masters on TV, it looks flat. And you're sitting there, you're wondering why guys are missing these little putts, why they're hitting putts so far off greens and things like that, and so far away. And you get out there, you get on that first tee, and then you realize how hilly the golf course really is. Very few people realize just how undulating Augusta is. It's extremely undulating, not a little bit, extremely. And if you think about that 10th tee shot that we all know so well, where you've got to hit, hit the big draw around the corner, you know, that's pretty close to a 100 foot drop from the tee box down into that fairway. It has a lot of elevation change that you don't realize at all. Television has a tendency to flatten the undulations out, and the greens are absolutely fascinating. There's no set of greens like them. Yes, Augusta, it always reminds me of a mouse trap with a bit of cheese that you just take a little note and it's gonna get you. Golf's first major is finally here and you can get in on all the action with DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can bet $5 on this week's major and get $25 in free bets for every birdie Bryson DeChambeau makes in the first round. DraftKings Sportsbook is a top rated app that gives you tons of ways to bet on golf. Whether it's single round matchups, tournament picks, DraftKings helps me stay closer to all the action and what's happening week in and week out on the tour. Best of all, DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Click the link in the description of this video and download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code MEMES, bet $5, and win $25 in free bets for every birdie that Bryson DeChambeau makes in the first round. Join the action for golf's first major with code MEMES only at DraftKings Sportsbook. My father being from Alabama, it was part of his Southern heritage. He always knew, they said, uh, son, one, one day we're gonna go to Augusta. Like every other kid, when I was you know, old enough to watch television, we'd watch the Masters. Even through the television, you could see or sense that it was a completely different arena that you could really hear the crowds. First tournament I ever watched on TV really was uh, the 86 Masters. The famous one where Jack was 46 years old and shot that 65 on, on Sunday to come back and win when everybody had kind of written him off. So that really grabbed my attention and I was like, man, that's, that's what I want to do. Even though I was only six years old at the time, I had already started golf and was just totally in love with the game. And I was like, man, I got to get to that place. You can imagine going to Augusta for the first time as a young man, walking through or driving through Magnolia Drive. In fact. I always make a point now of just walking through there. And I walk through there with one thought in mind, and that is gratitude for the journey that I've been able to have and the blessings that I've been bestowed upon. The first time ever walking on property would have been actually in college, driving in with the team. You know, we had the opportunity of playing once a year and, and driving down Magnolia Lane. You just sit there and you look left, look right, not only looking at the Magnolias, but well, you sit there going, wow, you know, thinking about all the greats that have played there. And then you step up and you, and you go to the range and the grass is just absolutely perfect. I think it was about 10 or 11 straight golf balls I didn't take a divot because I was scared to take a divot on the property. I'm like, it's too nice. I don't want to really you know, mess this place up. I couldn't believe I was there, to be honest, because from watching it on TV down in South Africa, it's 
that's a long way from, you know, Augusta, Georgia, growing up down in Cape Town and watching it on TV in the middle of the night because of the time change. I've always said it's one of the hardest courses to practice on because you can hit a lot of different shots around the greens in the practice rounds. And it always seems like if you miss a green and you put the ball off the green and you, you get up there and you say, you know, I haven't had this shot. Uh, you always have to build a shot and imagine a shot and create a shot. It's drama packed every single year. You see things there that you never ever forget in your life. One year I had a chance in 1962 to be the first player to ever win Augusta twice in a row. And I was playing with my dear friend Arnold Palmer and we were playing the 16th hole and I was two shots ahead with three to go. Really, I should win. I hit the shot 12 foot from the hole. He hit the worst looking shot you ever saw. He never even hit the green, he missed it on the right fringe. And that ball came down at 100 miles an hour, hit the flag, <laughs> went right in the hole. <laughs> and I, I was okay, I, I kept my cool. The next day, Arnold Palmer duck hooked it in that Eisenhower tree. I hit it way over the tree. He got underneath there with a five iron, punched it up onto the green, hold the putt, we tied for the tournament. We went in the playoff, 18 holes in those days, and I shot 33 the front nine. Feeling good, three shots ahead of him. The 10th hole, I had a beautiful second shot at the flag. He hit his luck. 35 foot to the right, one of those big breaking putts like that. I thought if he gets this down in two, he'll be doing well. It went in the hole. And I came to the conclusion that God was an American. <laughs> and uh, so you see things there that you don't see in other tournaments. You've got to have a mind like a steel trap. First of all, you've so damn nervous on that first tee. You're just trying to really get that thing airborne and somewhere in play. And then the second shot, you have to be so precise immediately off of a slight uphill lie. You have to be so precise with your distance control with all the ridges on that green. It slaps you in the face right from when you get going, but there's so many tough holes. The Masters is full of amazing traditions for both fans and the players. But for Masters champions, the two traditions that stand out are the champion's dinner and the green jacket ceremony. Champion's dinner hasn't always been a thing. It, it started in the 50s, correct? Ben Hogan started it. As a matter of fact, this year is going to be the 70th year for, for the champion's dinner. Walk us through preparation for that in your menu selection. It was kind of, it was kind of stressful because I wanted it to be uh, something special. And I wanted to find a way to bring some South African flavor and culture to the evening. It had been 30 years since the last South African winner there, which was Gary in 78. We actually ran a competition in a big newspaper down in South Africa and got people to write in what they thought would be uh, a good meal for us to have. I was going to make sure I filled everyone up enough where I felt like some of those guys would show up the next day feeling heavy and playing golf. You know, that was my, my plan. Up until uh, actually 1984, my, my year, you could only order off the menu at the club, which was wonderful. And in 1985, Sandy Lyle won, and the club said, you'll be able to bring in whatever you want to bring in. So Sandy Lyle, being a Scott, he had haggis. Most people think that the defending champion chooses a meal and that you are obligated to eat the meal, which is not so. I can't stand haggis, man. So, you know, I took some and put it under the table and gave it to the dog, but <laughs> not really. But I didn't want to have haggis because I know haggis. And Tiger, I think they both had cheeseburgers in them, strawberry malt or something like that. My second one, I had bar barbecue flown in from Texas. So it's been all over the map. Vividly remember afterwards, Jack Nicholas coming up to me, telling me how much he enjoyed the food. He goes down to South Africa a lot, spent a lot of time down there. So I kind of got a kick out of the fact that he appreciated that. But so when you're sitting at the head of that table and you're looking out at all these players that you've pretty much idolized throughout your uh, junior and amateur years, it's, uh, it's a pretty intimidating 
a few you know a few hours. What's the uh, structure of the setup like for that? Did you have to prepare some type of speech or talk about your menu or and then who do they sit you by as the champion? Mr. Crenshaw on one side, you the chairman on the other side, and, and then Mr. Nicholas is usually right near you, and then everyone else just kind of spread out. And that's what I love about it, is there's no assigned seating. There's a time throughout dinner where guys will just, you know, everyone stops talking and we'll, they'll go around the room and, and guys will start telling their stories and their experiences and just talking about different things. And, and I think that's that's the cool part is you just sit there and you can listen because it's not like there's 20 conversations going on at once. Each guy is basically standing up and saying something. And that's where it gets, uh, that's where it gets, some, you know, where you get the real good stories. So now Ben Hogan starts the dinner. Now I see this book coming around the table. <laughs> so everybody's signing it and it comes to me and I sign it. And it came from Horton Smith, the first winner of Augusta. And he had a junior that he was getting this book signed for, for encouragement for this kid to play golf. A lot of talent. I sign it and I put it in front of Hogan. Watch me, this is Hogan. Hogan is a tough cookie. But anyway, he's sitting like this and you see him look up like this in disgust. And he stands up, of course everything's quiet now and he takes the book and he goes, pow, on the table. Everybody jumped out of his skin. I don't want to repeat what he said. He said, who passed the so-and-so book up here? So Horton Smith said, Ben, I did. He said, I've got this dude. He said, Horton, this is the master's club. Not a so-and-so, so-and-so autograph session club. Don't you ever do that again. I mean, it was like a lecture at, at university. And today, to the contrary, everybody's got their flags out there. You're citing at least a hundred flags, which is nice because it goes to a variety of charities. And we as golfers have a debt incurred to help people and to make life easier for other people. This is the thing that I'm most proud about golf. It's what they do for charity. Walk us through the green jacket ceremony. That's probably one of the coolest traditions of the masters. Always been told whenever they're you know, you, when you're receiving the jacket is try to make it as smooth as possible. Because there's some guys that when they try to put it on and get the jacket on, they kind of get stuck and, and it kind of looks awkward. And, and when it went on smooth and Sergio uh, was putting it on me, it was such an amazing feeling. And all you can think of is when I went during college and stuff, you, you're able to go into the champion's locker room, they take you up there and you're able to see all the names on the lockers. And now, yours is going to be up there in in your locker with everyone else's and it's just an amazing feeling and then you know getting to know tiger and getting pretty close to tiger and having the opportunity to be able to slip the jacket on him was an absolutely amazing experience i mean i grew up watching tiger you start to see a lot of familiar faces from the world of golf who are there in an official capacity family is around your friends are around and then uh, for me, there for some reason were a bunch of South Africans in the crowd that year, and they were all there. And you can just, you can hear the accent; it's it's uh, you know unmistakable. And it was just so nice to be able to share that moment with them. And then from there, you go to the media and you do all the media, and uh, slowly but surely things start sinking in a little bit. At that point, as you're reminiscing uh, with the media about the day and answering questions. And then from there, you go to a dinner with the members, which was just an absolute blast. I mean, there I am. I still got my golf shoes on. I got the green jacket. I got, you know, the same outfit that I won the tournament in probably, you know, whatever it is, two, three hours earlier. You know, to have my dear friend Arnold Palmer, who I admired so much, and Jack Nicklaus, who was the greatest gentleman I ever played golf with. And then Tom Watson, who I admired very much indeed, is a, is a big thrill and it's something that you never forget about. I believe me, that feeling is sublime. It's sublime because it lasts for the rest of your life. You take the jacket and I go home to South Africa to be received with a wonderful ovation. And I've got the green jacket there, I'm not wearing it, but I've got it in my suitcase. Two days later, the phone goes, Gary, this is Clifford Roberts here. Did you take the green jacket off the property? I said, uh, yes, Mr. Roberts, why? Nobody takes the green jacket from Augusta. So I thought very quickly. And I said, well, Mr. Roberts, if you want the jacket, come and get it. <laughs> he did see the funny side and he said, please, 
just don't wear it in public, which I never did. But now you can. Now it's a complete changes the price of survival. So they've changed it dramatically now. But I took it home and I put it in a plastic bag with my honours blazer from other sports. Lucky I didn't sell it. It was the day you could sell it for a hundred grand. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's amazing how they've managed to hold on to some of the traditions but still make sure that things are getting better and better and bringing in technology along with that. And just to be a little part of Augusta still, and I think Augusta have been really, really smart and sensitive in a very nice manner to keep that little feeling that you can be an integral part of the tournament. As a competitor, you have to believe that you can win in order for you to even have a chance. But until you've done it, there's always that little self-doubt in the back of your mind that always comes out and says, well, you know, you haven't done it yet. Once you win the first one, you sit there, you go, all right, well, I've done it already. I know I can do it because I have the green jacket. So every time you go back, you have that confidence that you have a chance to win. I've always said it was the most tempting course in the world. The possibilities of how you can play it are, are endless. Because so, so many of the memories, not just from that week, but from you know all the other times I've been there, they just flood right through you. The place is so special to any person that has grown up loving the game of golf or wanting to be great at the game of golf. If you get to play in the Masters, then you, you've made it in a sense. And so going back there now, knowing that I'm like this tiny little thread, you know, in this tapestry of the Masters tournament is pretty incredible. You know, you walk into the clubhouse and you see your picture on the wall, you go up to the champion's locker room, uh, you see the list of you know, players that have won there, all the guys that I looked up to when I was a kid, and, was trying to emulate and be like and play like. Uh, so it's quite an amazing feeling really to, to think that you're this tiny little part of that in the history of the tournament. Uh, it's, it's, maybe it still hasn't sunk in to be honest. <laughs>